After the explosion of Unit 4 at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant in April of 1986, the remains of what was once one of the most advanced nuclear reactors in the Soviet Union lay scattered. Some landed on the ground close to the building, and was enclosed in the Cascade Wall. However, a lot of the fuel and graphite also landed on the roofs of the vent block and Unit 3. The Soviet Union, desperate to restart the three remaining reactors at Chernobyl as soon as possible, wanted to cover the destroyed reactor, and this meant removing all of this waste. Humans were not the first choice. To preserve lives, they turned to robots. Of all these machines, one of them is known by name far more than the others, and that is the Joker robot. This is the story of the little robot that met its fate on the roof of the nuclear power plant from beginning to end. The year is 1974, and West Germany is experiencing a nuclear boom. Many reactors are now well underway in construction, such as at the Neckarwestheim and Isar nuclear power plants. But the Germans are interested in developing robots to undertake the jobs of maintenance and repair work in the hazardous radioactive environments. The company KHG, which still exists today and is tasked with mitigating the effects of nuclear accidents, began creating a series of robots to survive these situations. The MF2 robot, which had been under development for the previous two years, is the product of this work and was one of the most advanced robots of its time. TV communication allowed the operators to work at a safe distance, through a radio frequency with a distance of up to one kilometer, while the robot could cut, drill, saw, weld, and even collect samples and return them back to the safe point. Shielding was very strong around the core technology, which was kept low to the ground to maximize protection. KHG also made another robot to work in these extreme situations in 1976, the MF3. This device was designed for extreme terrains, such as climbing stairs and ledges, and was controlled using a cable. The 1970s was also a tumultuous time for West Germany, with the far-left militant group, the Red Army Faction, associated in numerous attacks and raids throughout the country. The KHG, concerned about the risks of these, handed over the MF2 to the police for use as a combat engineering vehicle, and it was here that the robot earned its nickname, Joker, and was modernised in 1982. And this seemed to be the final fate of the little robot, acting as a mind diffuser, until news from the Soviet Union made its way west. As mentioned before, the Soviets were desperate to eliminate the consequences of this accident, and that meant cleaning the roofs as quickly as possible. To do this, a series of robots were employed, including the Lunar Rover designs, but those were not durable enough to withstand the vent block roof, known as Marsha, and the intense radioactivity in this region. So, the Soviet Union began purchasing more durable robots, and this included both Joker and the younger model, the MF3. The robots soon arrived in Pripyat, where the last preparations were made for an expedition onto the roof, charging its batteries in the Special Engineering Works facility, a building repurposed by the liquidators to manage all the robots. This building is next to where the claw is today, just so you know where we are. And you can also see that when I say the word little in terms of the little robot, I don't mean it literally. And when Joker reached the roof in August of 1986, it found itself caught between a real-life struggle between opposing sides in the liquidation effort. Unlike HBO's miniseries, however, Legasov and Shibina did not play any part in sticking up for the liquidators and men who would inevitably go on the roof. They were more on the side of trying to hasten the rate of liquidation. The role of saving lives was played by one Yuri Samoylenko, a dosimetrist who had been at the nuclear power plant during the explosion on April 26th. He had been among the people who went out onto the roof to survey the levels of radiation, and he knew himself how dangerous exposure would be. Samoylenko was insistent that Joker be dropped onto the cleared roof of the Unit 3 reactor hall, and then wheeled up the ramp to Marsha. 
but he was under pressure from the Soviet government, and soon it was demanded that Joker be landed directly onto the Marsha roof. Samoylenko protested, but there was nothing he could do. The robot was flown in by helicopter, like many other robots, held up on a small platform high above the building. A winch was used to hold onto the robot so it could be pulled back in case of emergency. And so Joker was released. This was, of course, never a good idea. Samoylenko was right. It was too risky to release Joker onto the debris-ridden Marsha roof. And soon, as Joker began to move away and into work, it caught itself on some technological channels, the pipes that carried water through the reactor, but had been ejected from Unit 4, and left it trapped, unable to move its tracks with a large chunk of graphite block directly underneath. You may recall me previously saying that Joker had been reinforced for radiation around the sides, but this was not considered for the bottom of the machine. And so, Joker was now completely trapped against perhaps the most radioactive thing it could have been. Samoylenko knew what this would mean, sending people onto the roof. And so, they were deployed, both to try and winch Joker backwards away from the pipe, and also to inspect visually from the edge of Marsha. Eventually, they were able to do so, pulling Joker away from the graphite and off the pipe. But it was already too late. The computer on Joker had been fried by the radiation, and its fate was sealed. For the likes of Samoylenko, thoroughly defeated at the sight of the failure of Joker, there was only one option left here. People had to go onto the roof to do this job, where Joker could not. The government commission agreed, and General Nikolai Tarakanov became the head of the so-called bio-robots. Men ran onto Marsha and began to throw the debris down into the reactor hall. Shifts were limited to as short as 30 seconds or as long as 10 minutes. Firefighters were tasked with cleaning the vent stack atop Marsha, and then a small crew ran to plant a red flag atop. As for Joker, it remained trapped on the roof, winched back to a corner and a mere spectator of the cleanup it should have partaken in. The younger model, the MF3, was actually quite successful in the cleanup of the areas it was assigned to but Joker remained a useless object to be eventually removed. The sarcophagus was largely completed by November, and it was at this time Joker was hauled back off the roof for scrapping. And now, the tragic story of this robot came to its new unceremonial home. Buria Kivka. While some robots were spared this fate and became members of the Open Air Museum, most of the computers were ripped out of Joker and disposed of as were the crane and equipment that gave it its iconic design. The shell of Joker remains radioactive, emitting roughly the equivalent of four months of normal background radiation every hour. The Buria Kivka burial ground will almost certainly be the final resting place, as it will for the remaining vehicles at the site, crushed into compact forms and buried when the waste site is expanded, as the Ukrainian government has been planning for years. Joker today is remembered as a small part of the Chernobyl story, but it played a significant role. It was the failure of this robot that doomed thousands to fight on the roof of Marsha to clear it of its debris, and equally a minor yet poignant example of the disregard for human life over trying to maximise their own successes.